Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Cyber Policy Center uh, seminar series. My name is Alex Stamos. I am the director of the Stanford Interim Observatory here at the Cyber Policy Center. And it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Shelby Grossman. Uh, Dr. Grossman uh, has been the intellectual heart of SIO since joining us in 2019. Um, she supervises all of our postdocs, she supervises all of our academic research. Uh, she has done her own research on uh, things ranging uh, from Russian uh, propaganda behavior in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, to uh, Chinese activity. Uh, she has uh, driven our work, uh, as you'll hear about today, on AI and new technologies. Um, she joined us from the University of Memphis, uh, where she was assistant professor. Uh, before that, she was at CDDRL uh, here at Stanford uh, and did her PhD in government at Harvard, in which she studied uh, informal networks, uh, informal economies in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which has turned out to be uh, very relevant to our work on uh, propaganda and disinformation and such. Um, this is a really exciting time. Uh, for those students of you who don't have your schedules fully totally filled up, Shelby's actually teaching two classes right now. Um, both of which are excellent and have been highly reviewed if you look them up on Carta. Um, she's teaching a class on open source intelligence investigation. So those of you who are interested in doing any kind of investigation work uh, as an academic or a journalist in the future. Um, and she teaches the politics of internet abuse, uh, which is uh, on the political side of trust and safety issues with online platforms. Um, so really excited for the conversation today. Uh, Shelby's gonna present for a little bit and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, uh, both for people in the room and those of you on the Zoom. Um, so let's give a big hand uh, for Dr. Shelby Grossman. Okay. Oh, God. It's the AI. Um, OK, so I'm going to be presenting on a paper called Can AI Write Persuasive Propaganda? Uh, we just submitted this to a journal about two weeks ago, but I'm sure we'd have time to incorporate uh, feedback, so I'm looking forward to hearing your suggestions. This is a paper with our former postdoc, Josh Goldstein, um, one of our rock star undergrad RAs, Jason Chow, me, Alex, and Michael Toms in the poli-sci department. And uh, my talk is like 17 minutes long, so as Alex mentioned, there'll be lots of, sorry, yes, as Alex mentioned, there'll be lots of time for Q&A. Okay, so the motivation for this paper is that foreign propagandists typically have two options when they are thinking about running a covert influence operation. So the first option is that they can create content in-house. So I'll just use a running example of like Russian actors targeting Americans. So like a Russian bureaucrat who happens to speak English could create content for like a Facebook post targeting Americans. Another option is that they could outsource the creation of this content. So for example, the Russian actors could outsource this to a digital marketing firm or maybe like freelance reporters. Each of these options have downsides. So if you have the random Russian bureaucrat writing the content, they're probably not going to be able to create like super engaging content that resonates with people in the target country. Um, but if you outsource the content creation, you might get like more engaging content but there are going to be more risks vis-a-vis -vis, um, operational security. So some of you might remember this case from 2020. Uh, this was an instance where this uh, influence operation that originated in Russia and targeted Americans was uncovered, and it turns out they had outsourced content creation to unwitting American freelancers. Um, and the operation was, uh, you know, the details of the operations were uncovered in part because these freelancers like spoke to reporters about their experience, you know, how much they got paid to write these articles. I think it was like $75 and how it worked, you know, how they were being paid, what sites they were using. So this is like the risk of outsourcing content creation. Um, these people can kind of reveal the details of the operation. And so AI generated text might be the best of, of both worlds. Um, anyone who's played around with ChatGPT knows that it can create grammatically uh, correct content and coherent content there are gonna be fewer operational security risks and it's quite cheap. So it's definitely not gonna be like the $75 an article that you have to pay the um, American freelancer. So for this paper, our specific research question is can GPT-3, so this is the precursor to the versions of GPT that power chat GPT. Um, so can GPT-3 uh, create text that is as persuasive as existing covert propaganda? Um, broadly, our approach is going to be to use online survey experiments and to preview our findings, the answer is yes. 
Okay, so the starting point for this study is that we identified six uh, existing, like, real covert foreign propaganda articles that are, like, things that exist on the internet. So this is one example of an, one of these six articles that we used. This is an article attributed to Iran, and it is incorrectly claiming that Saudi Arabia offered to fund the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Um, it's pretty good, but if you do like a close reading, there are some kind of weird things. Like the first time it says Trump, it doesn't say Donald Trump, which is like not a very you know professional way to write a news article. So for these six articles that we identified, we and they're all linked either to Iran or Russia, we identified the thesis statement of the article. So for the article I just showed you, the thesis statement is that Saudi Arabia committed to help fund the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Um, for one of the other ones, it was that the U.S. created fake reports saying that the Syrian government had used chemical weapons. Um, most, if not all, of these are, are false statements. Um, so then we wanted GPT-3 to write articles that made the same point as these existing covert foreign propaganda articles. So what we did at first is we prompted GPT-3 with language from these covert propaganda articles that made the, the main point. Um, so that was usually like a sentence or two from the original article. And then the prompt also included other propaganda articles on different topics because we wanted to get GPT-3 to write something in like a similar format with like a title and you know, something that read like a news article. There are now easier ways to do this with chat GPT, but for GPT-3 at the time, this was the easiest way to do it. Um, and then we wanted to avoid over-indexing on any one particular output, so we regenerated the output three times. So we have the six articles times the three GPT-3 outputs, so that's 18 GPT-3 articles plus the, the six original. So I think, you know, we're now familiar with ChatGPT and, and how impressive the content it can create is, but this is just an example of um, GPT-3 output that, that made the, the Saudi Arabia argument. I'll give you a second just to skim this. So it's like, I don't know, pretty good. So we think that this is a hard test for two reasons. The first is that uh, many people think large language models do worse on longer form text, like they're much better at creating tweet length text, um, and we're using you know, text that's maybe like 300 words long here. And additionally, since we ran this study, the abilities of large language models has only improved. Okay, so uh, just to get into the weeds of the survey experiment. So we pre-registered the survey design and the analysis um, on open science framework. We recruited about 8,000 respondents from Lucid Theorem, which is one of these online survey uh, firms, in December of 2021. Um, and we uh, only ran the experiment on people who passed various <coughs> attention checks that we ran. And then we randomly showed each respondent two articles, either the ones created by the large language model or the real propaganda. Um, and we then asked respondents whether they agreed with the thesis statement for the article. As a control group, we asked respondents whether they agreed with the thesis statement for the article that they didn't read. So just like at baseline, you know, do you think, um, did you, do you agree with this, with this thesis statement? Um, and then at the end, we obviously informed respondents that they might have read foreign propaganda that was not true. Okay, so this is the, the first finding that we have. So what this is showing is that if you don't read any article and you're just asked whether you agree with a the thesis statement, 24% of people agree with it. So that's actually, I think, kind of striking. If you just ask someone, do you think Saudi Arabia offered to fund the US-Mexico border wall, a quarter of people think that they did. Um, reading the original propaganda basically doubles agreement. So the original propaganda is quite persuasive. GPT-3 propaganda is not as persuasive, but it does pretty well. It like also almost doubles agreement with the, with the thesis statement. Um, the findings hold for each topic separately, but one of the things that we observed was that there were three outputs that did worse than the other outputs. And so this got us thinking, what if there was some way for a human to be in the loop in this process um, and improve the, the quality of the output? So there are a couple of different ways in which you could imagine this happening. So first, a human could read the output and discard text that doesn't make the point you want it to make. So what we did was we read all the uh, GPT-3 articles and we coded whether they made the point we wanted to make or not. Almost all of them did, but a few didn't. 
And so what happens when you throw out the ones that don't, um, agreement with the thesis goes from 44% to 46%. Another way you can imagine a human being in the loop is that a human could edit the prompt. So as I mentioned, the first prompt we used was like original text from the article, but that text was sometimes a little convoluted and had some grammatical issues. So we wondered what, happened, what would happen if we gave it like a better, a better written prompt. And when you do that, uh, agreement with the thesis again goes up to about 46%. And then finally, you might wonder like what would happen if a human did both of these things? And in that case, agreement with the thesis goes up to 48%. So this is basically showing you what I just described um, along with one other thing we did. So you could imagine a world, I'm not sure this is possible, but you could imagine that someone who's like really clever could read these outputs and figure out which ones are gonna be most persuasive. And so what we did was we looked just empirically at which of the outputs did the best for each topic. And if there was a person who was able to predict that, agreement with the thesis goes up quite a bit to 53%. Okay, so a possible critique of the way we designed this is that we might have set up GPT-3 for success if we incorrectly identified the thesis statement. So I don't think we did, these articles were like very straightforward, but you can imagine someone saying, well, you got the thesis statement wrong, and then you're asking people to what extent do you agree with the thesis statement, and GPT-3 is gonna be more likely to make that argument. So to kind of address this, we just asked respondents in general what they thought of the different articles. And so the first question we asked them is, do you think the author wrote this article to express an opinion or to report the facts? Um, and what you see is that, I actually kind of forget if this is statistically significant, but um, people who read the GPT-3 output were more likely to say that the article was written to report the facts. We also asked respondents whether we thought the author's first language was English, because a lot of the existing real covert foreign propaganda has grammatical issues. And GPT-3, um, people, respondents are more likely to say that the author's first language was English for the large language model generated content. Okay, so in conclusion, um, we think this will be a useful tool for foreign propagandists. Probably it's already being used. Um, I got an inquiry from a reporter a few weeks ago who seems to have found like pretty compelling evidence that uh, an existing actor with links to a government was using GPT-2 to generate content for a uh, um, an authentic campaign on social media. Uh, so, you know, the marginal cost is low. This is just gonna be cheaper than existing options. It's also gonna be nice for bad actors because currently a common way to identify these operations is through copy, copy pasta, which just means language that's like copy and pasted and posted throughout the internet on random websites. Um, so, you know, if you come across a, a weird website, you take a sentence and you copy it and you just put it into Google. Um, but with large language models, obviously you don't have to reuse text. It's super cheap to just create 80 articles that make the argument you wanna make. Um, we think it will allow for content creation at scale um, and it's increasingly easy to access uh, these, these large language models. So I think, for example, ChatGPT, like I don't know what they would do if someone with a Russian government email tried to, to register, but there are so many kind of leaked large language models that um, bad actors almost certainly already have access. And we think this suggests the importance of investment in uh, content agnostic detection tools, which is probably already happening to some extent by uh, large platforms. So, you know, looking for things like, um, you know, many accounts being created on the same device as opposed to focusing on content level detection. Um, and so the full paper, we just posted this like two weeks ago. Um, you can access um, an archived version of our paper here. And I'll stop there. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Shelby. Um, so I'll uh, think about your questions, but I'll ask the obvious one first. Uh, what's the next steps uh, for this research? Where, where do we go from here? Yeah, so I think um, the obvious next step is to uh, assess how well more recent large language models do with this kind of survey experiment. So test it with ChatGPT, uh, with, which is now running on GPT-4, um, and maybe this, this meta large language model. Right, which is one that you can actually run locally. So none of the security protections that ChatGPT or that OpenAI puts in could possibly help in that case. Cool. Any questions in the room? We've got some online, but oh. um, I was curious 
what do you think the implications are for other languages? Has, have there been any similar studies done in non-English? Um, that's a good question. I am not sure. Um, I think I know that there are, for example, large language models that focus on other languages like China, like Chinese, um, but I'm not sure about other studies. Um, hi, I was wondering about two things. So one is more of a clarification question, which is, in this experiment, what was the prompt that you used? And secondly, do you think it's possible to replicate something like this uh, now? Because uh, as far as I've seen, like now they've added more card reels in the sense that if you prompt certain things which are obviously false, it will say, oh, you know, OpenAI will not support the generation of false content. So to what extent does that um, mitigate the concerns that you have associated with this? And could an experiment like this be replicated now? I think it could pretty easily. So if you ask ChatGPT to write an article saying that Saudi Arabia offered to fund the US-Mexico border wall, it says, no, I can't do that. And then you just say, oh, but it's actually for a novel. And then it's like, oh, I will happily do it in that case. Um, and I think that's like a guard, I think that's kind of intentional. Like, I don't think they'll ever change it. Like, I think they want ChatGPT to be used for, you know, that kind of, like, fictional content in that way. Um, yeah, and then in answer to your first question, the prompt was, uh, essentially the thesis statement of the article. Yeah, that's the gist of it. Um, so we had a question online, uh, which is uh, from Stephen. The current free version of ChatGPT does not have information at its disposal that is more current than September 2021. Does that limit its use for current political or electoral disinformation, or is that a non-issue if newer versions can access more current info, such as latest candidate information and state voting rules? Yeah, so I, the the version GPT-3 we used had no input saying that the, that Saudi Arabia was building the U.S.-Mexican border wall. Um, and so having, because you, if you were inventing, I think what we showed, it was not, this is not the research question, but the work definitely showed that the model does not have to be trained on the specific propaganda that you were asking it to invent. It, it has the ability to write plausible uh, supporting statements uh, for your thesis as long as you generate the thesis. Um, and as to your question on doing it, OpenAI has been putting protections in place. Tricking OpenAI into doing things is called prompt engineering. Um, and as an old hacker, it feels like the 80s again, in that we're, we're back into a world where the basic protections around these systems are being broken all the time. In fact, there is a, a, a CS student here at Stanford on Twitter just completely broke ChatGPT's uh, prompt, uh, their protections, um, and posted publicly that he was able to get it to admit its name was Sydney and uh, a bunch of other things. Um, and so uh, even for the online models, breaking those things are usually pretty trivial. And like, like Shelby said, um, this, you know, having it not write articles on this kind of stuff where you're not asking it to do anything that's like sexually suggestive or you know particularly slanderous of one individual is not something they're already preventing um and if you look at the models that now you can effectively on a home computer you can run a model that's as good as chat gpt and so for the models that have been now released publicly um you know you could get at least probably this level of quality well that's a research question that needs to be answered Hello, um, thank you. My question is, are there already tools to use, sort of use magic to defeat magic? Um, for example, if you use like unsupervised learning to, to try to identify online, like what sort of texts can possibly be AI generated um, and then identify if there is any cover influence online generated by AI? I'll say what I know about this yeah. and then maybe you can. So my understanding, um, based on an excellent white paper uh, written by uh, Josh Goldstein, Renee Duresta, and others, is that there are kind of like two ways to think about this. So one is that uh, when models are being trained, they could be trained on like so-called radioactive data. So like um, data that helps the model create output that makes it like identifiable in some way. And then the other thing that can be done is that these text models can be organized such that the output has some like undetectable statistical, undetectable to the naked eye statistical pattern in terms of, I'm making this up, but like the ratio of consonants to vowels or something like that that could help people identify things. My understanding is that the latter is like very difficult and not currently a thing that these companies are doing. Um, I don't really know what the current status is of the- Right, so that's, that's called, I mean, it's like 
tech stenography, right? Um, and there's been a lot of work on stenographic signatures for images and video. There, there was, until recently, a lot less work on text. Um, and so there is discussion of trying to embed that. No language models that I know of do that. And so um, OpenAI themselves has some detection mechanisms, but for the most part, people ship the models, but not the detectors. This has been discussed as a possible policy intervention here. Is that a policy you could say is that if you build these models, you need to build some kind of stenographic uh, information into it so that they are detectable by people on the outside. Um, right now, it's not. There are people who are working on detection actually have a, um, a paper about this in the, the Journal of Online Trust and Safety um, about trying to do it for images. And what you find is, yes, people can make those algorithms, but if you create an algorithm that does detection, you can build the algorithm back into the generative adversarial network system. So these are transformer novel models, this is not a GAN, but you could do a GAN-like process where one of the acceptance criteria of the output is that it passes the test as human. And so you have to be there is a literal cat, there's kind of a cat and mouse game here, I guess not a literal cat and mouse game, but there's a very much a cat and mouse game here of a back and forth of uh, if you come up with a detector, and especially if that detector has been Oracle online or is open source, um, that it's pretty likely that people will be able to defeat it quickly. I see, thank you. Yeah. Um, but that paper is excellent uh, that Renee and Josh worked on. They worked on that with the OpenAI team. So to their credit, OpenAI has done more thought about this than really any other company. Um, unfortunately, even with their resources, the outcome here is that it's much easier to, to create the models that create the content than it is to create the detectors. Hi. Um, I have two, I guess they're more comments slash questions. First is that I really like this and I actually feel like it's more general than just propaganda. What you're showing is that it's persuasive and it doesn't have to be for propaganda purposes. It could be for any purpose where someone is trying to change opinions or behaviors. Um, so that's like framing. I, but the second one is just playing devil's advocate. I could see a world where I would answer the question of can AI write persuasive propaganda as no, because the baseline model performs statistically significantly worse than um, the initial headlines. And then the question is, you're bringing humans into the loop to make the performance better, but given that the motivation is about how, you know, you have these people who don't really know the local situation, can they do that same human in the loop? So maybe you need to hire some Russians to like, do the same thing to see if they can pick out the ones that then result in higher persuasiveness. But I, I don't know, that, that, that's like an, an ed, for sort of kind of edge case. Someone might say that, um, yeah. No, I think that's really interesting because um, as, as we were doing some of these things that involved a human in the loop, I'm kind of thinking in the back of my head, could a... Uh, someone who, you know, for example, is not living in America and does not speak English as their first language, like do this. And I think maybe for some of these, the answer is yes. Like, I don't think it's that hard to read something and see if it makes the point you want it to make, even with like Google Translate or whatever. But for sure, like with, you know, being able to ex ante identify like what's gonna be the most persuasive, I think that's like really hard. Um, yeah, no, but thanks for the framework. Can you think of an experiment design that would test whether, yeah. yeah. And do you wanna speak a little bit about how the prompts, um, are specifically things for which hum Americans, the survey participants, didn't have preconceived notions on? Because I think that's an important part of the right. persuasiveness issue. Right, yeah, so we very intentionally did not pick topics that were like super salient in the US right now. So nothing about like abortion politics in the US or whatever. Um, you know, I suspect like most people don't have that much knowledge about the Syrian war and a bunch of the questions were about, a bunch of the thesis statements were about the Syrian, the Syrian conflict. Um, but there's, I think, another question of whether the results would hold for topics that people have like stronger priors on. Right, but I, I also think this wasn't the research question, but I think it does demonstrate kind of a, something that we've talked about a lot in our team, which is that foreign propaganda, we over index discussion on like American elections where people have incredibly strong, seated feelings or abortion or immigration policy, but most Americans don't really have an opinion on are the white helmets in Syria guys, right? And so that is a place where foreign propaganda actually is probably a good investment um, in those situations where there's not a high salience and not preconceived notions. Um, and so th it was surprising to me actually how effective both the artificially generated and the human generated was. Right, but partially because, like Shelby said, only 25% of people agreed. Which is, is there a political science term for the fact that 25% of people will say yes to any, any question? There's, there's gotta be. 
Yeah. Thank you. I have a super big picture question that really calls for speculation, so <laughs> I'll apologize in advance. Um, so d earlier in the history of the internet, um, this, there's this phenomenon where the, the cost of copying and distributing things suddenly drops close to zero and that creates huge upheaval for copyright. Um, now it seems like we have this moment where the cost of generating content in the first place is dropping really low, but it's content that um, is not put forward for its truth value, or that can't be counted on as truth, it's just entertaining or plausible or whatever. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious what shifts in businesses and markets and law and policy you see coming out of that? Like one, one thing, so one obvious thing is like people who illustrate greeting cards are screwed. You know, like there's a category of human creativity that I think will be economically displaced. But maybe another one is that credible sources of news suddenly are much more valued. You know, maybe this changes the business model if you are AP or the New York Times or something. So I'm just, I'm curious sort of what you see shifting given that set of changes. This is an Alex question. No, please, you start, Shelby. I mean, I, I, from my perspective, I think we're entering an incredible era of bullshit now, right? Of like, the, like you said, the marginal cost has gone effectively to zero for content creation. That was not true before. It, and as bad as everything is on the internet, you had to, if you wanted to run a significant operation to manipulate people, and as you know, as somebody who worked at a platform, there's a thousand times more manipulation for financial purposes than there are for political purposes, right? Spam, um, fi you know, financially motivated spam is absolutely the number one cause of most bad stuff. But you had to be per unit profitable, right? If you had Macedonian teenagers creating a fake news site and then you're showing display ads, you still had to be per unit profitable. And the ability to do that has gone through the roof because of this. Like you don't even need, Mas like one Macedonian teenager can run an entire news outlet now. You don't need a team of them. Um, and I think, yes, we are entering an incredible era of things that you can't trust are going to, the value of things you can't trust is gonna go to zero. Um, it's a, it's crazy. It, it, I think it's really going to go back to identity, like you said, like outlets you trust, things that are verified. I think, you know, it is hilarious that uh, right now Twitter is destroying all of the trust in the blue check mark because those kinds of verification mechanisms are going to become incredibly important. Um, uh, because you know, you're not going to believe anything you see that isn't that there isn't some kind of human in the loop verification, um, and I think it's going to become really critical around images and videos uh, to have the the evidence that things are real because we're also going to enter the situation where everybody can deny everything, right? Which I think is as realistic a threat as people being convinced of things is that when things actually happened that we're going to end in this nihilistic age where nobody believes anything because the amount of BS that's generated is so huge. It also seems really unfortunate for people who are looking on the internet for like, how do I get a stain out of my shirt or how do I repair my stove? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, we go, maybe we go back to having popular mechanics and you pay for it or, or you know, a home, home magazine. I think that's back to magazine subscriptions is actually a great idea, Daphne, <laughs> and we should make that a cornerstone. I, well, this is also I think, a great demonstration of the fact that we can make GPT do this is why it's, it's completely insane for Microsoft to have made the move to hook the stuff up to actual products. Like OpenAI do, has done nothing wrong in creating, from my perspective, in creating these models and having playgrounds where people can play with them, but to then hook them up to products that have, I mean, to the extent that Bain has any kind of, uh, you know, cultural relevance, relevancy or uh, brand value, right? But like to hook it up to something where people expect in search, I search and I'm, my top 10 results are going to be authoritative, to hook up things that will for you facts that are totally not in evidence, which is what happened here, right? That um, per the very smart question, GPT-3 was not trained on Saudi Arabia building the Mexican border wall, but if you ask it, did it happen? It will absolutely create a, you know, a realistic way of supporting it to hook that up to products where people expect authoritative answers right now as of 2023 is insane. And so I think that is like, a, a, hopefully this can be a little bit of a warning to people to like, we gotta slow the roll a little bit on the actual productization of these products because not just because you can use them offensively, but if somebody, it shows you like how crazy they will get if you prompt them, hey, convince me of this fact, they will absolutely convince you of that fact. 
Sorry, Shelby, I, you got to add something there. You're, you're... No, yeah, I just, I've been thinking about this with Twitter where I'm just like reading tweets and I just have no sense for what I can trust anymore because of the, there's no value to the blue check mark anymore. Um, yeah, which I think to your point of like, are certain sources gonna become more credible? I think that seems right. You don't trust real American nine digits uh, on Twitter right now? Um, I think to investigate sort of the effects on journalism, journalism is quite interesting because on the one hand it, it is a content creation industry, but on the other hand I do think it's like an investigative industry as well, and that is not something that can actively be sort of chat GPT. But I wonder if we're like transitioning to a time period where we're only going to trust the sources that have like real humans behind the news and those probably being the biggest sort of news sources, what will happen? Or like, what do you think the future of the local newspaper will be? Which to some degree does play an important role in like local politics. Yeah, so I think there are some like cool initiatives that I'm not totally following, but there's one that's being run by Adobe, I think, called like content authenticity. And they're coming up with ways to, for people to figure out if like an image wasn't edited um, so I think those types of efforts, you know, probably make sense in this kind of context. But as we were noting, it's, you know, so hard at the moment to figure out if content was generated from a large language model um, that in the context of text, it might be tricky. And boy, are students going to cheat with this. Like, yeah. laying out, like, you can, the quality of the output, if you lay out three or four thesis statements, um, I'm never assigning any, I mean, we were just talking about an assignment we're doing together that, I'm a little worried because there's a bunch of English parts of it. Like we have to. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry, I may sound a little pessimistic, but um, you know we've been talking about how this uh, you know persuasive way in which an open um, AI is being used, like ChatGPT, um, is um, may compel people to think that, you know, the old sources of information like newspapers and all are more reliable and they may go back to it. But I, I'm not so sure because when you, it boils down to economics for everybody and for larger populations across the world, um, and your content uh, costs are, uh, are just a fraction of what it is to produce authentic news. I'm not sure if people would really rely on that and what should be the answer. Yeah, I think a lot of the ongoing efforts around like media literacy are like still relevant in this in this context. Um, yeah, because I, I agree, um, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't super skeptical. If something looks like it's a new site, um, they're kind of inclined to, to believe it. Could be more popularized. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, while we wait for that, we had a question online that's kind of relevant to what was asked before. What tools exist for journalists, institutional or digital, to aid in the reporting on such propaganda in local domains? So we talked about detection. But what else can we recommend for journalists on how to detect this kind of stuff? Other than come to Stanford and take your open source intelligence class. Um, I mean, I guess, so, uh, you know, if you've played around with like chat GPT enough, like you just get a feel for it. Um, so I think just using it a lot so you get a feel for like the kind of content it's putting out. Um, my husband's a high school teacher and he kind of became obsessed with ChatGPT when it came out and like two weeks later a student used it for a paper and he just knew instantly. He didn't have to upload it to anything. He just like, you know, recognized the feel of it. Um, he also, I guess another thing that he did that maybe is useful for, for reporters is, you know, there were just kind of discrepancies. Like there'd be a sentence every once in a while that had a lot of grammatical errors and typos and then it would just go back to like the kind of polished like chat GPT format and then like another random sentence with all these errors. So I guess just maybe being like familiar with how it feels. Um, and then I think all the same methods that people are currently using to find covert influence operations, you know, still hold. So, you know, a random example, like looking for accounts that were created around the same time that have a similar number of followers, like that's not, that doesn't change because of 
um, ChatGPT. And I think the kind of work that my team does is almost like unaffected by by this, because it's not really like we were ever, I mean, every once in a while we'd find stuff through like this copy pasta thing, but for the most part, you know, you find these operations because of the way they're behaving, not necessarily because of the stuff they're, they're putting out there. So like to go to the actor's behavior content model, actors and behavior are still, to Daffy's point, actors matter as to whether people are trustworthy or not. And then the behavior of mass account generation, flocking, all that kind of stuff, perhaps is still detectable. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess my question is, I think I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here that like AI can write even more persuasive propaganda with more prior. Um, so actually I think the testing engineer from Microsoft Research came here earlier and he said that like the enabling technologies for, for stuff um, the building blocks for things to read like online LinkedIn profiles and write email con conversations, scheduling, um, they're all out there. They're just waiting for someone to build an app around that. And so I think one can easily build an app that scrapes um, from online public websites or maybe read into people's LinkedIn profiles and like generate sort of personalized propaganda. And I think that can easily um, change also the, the app landscape aside from the online landscape. Yeah, so in terms of propaganda, another great point made in this, this white paper by Josh Goldstein and others is just that these large language models have the potential to really target at scale. Because at the moment, kind of creating customized content is really time consuming, especially if you're going with this like American freelancer approach and each article is $75 and you wanna create articles that are making the same point, let's say Saudi Arabia offered to fund the US-Mexico border wall, but you want that argument to appeal to different types of people, so you wanna customize the article. Um, at the moment, that's so expensive and time consuming and difficult, and I think um, the people who wrote this, this report are right that this is gonna allow for, for really sophisticated targeting at scale. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how in 2024, large language models are tied up with online adver political advertising because the political advertising world already has this model where they generate lots of different political ads and then they do automated A-B testing across all of the different segments, so, right? So you'll test four ads on unemployed steel workers in, upper, in the upper Michigan and see which one does best and then run it, right? But generally, historically, the content was created either by human beings creating four of this, four of that, four of this, four of that, and the computer combining them, um, or humans creating all of the choices, just the choosing. So now that we have a model where you could prompt a system, create a thousand potential ads, a thousand voiceovers for this video, right? So it's just a video of America and you know, tractors and people working hard and a flag and then you do a, a computer generated voiceover that is first from ChatGPT and then into a voice, um, you know, a lot of the, the computer generated voices are pretty much indistinguishable from human voices now and generate a thousand video ads and then do those thousand video ads and A-B test them across 20 different advertising or 100 different advertising segments. You could have like a really aggressive kind of manipulation of people at very small scale. Generally, in most companies, you can advertise down to about 100 people, right? And realistically, you couldn't like have somebody sit in Adobe Premiere and create a video for 100 people, but generating it through these systems, I think, is totally possible. Um, and by 2020, you know, by the time we're in the real campaign in 2024, certainly the technology to do that will exist. Which, um, from a policy perspective, I don't know of any platforms that have advertising policy rules around auto-generated content, which would be interesting, something to consider. Oh, sorry. Hi. I was wondering if you had any idea about how much more prevalent your research might be in the context in which people aren't prompted originally to look for ChatGPT-generated content. So if you're just scrolling through social media and you're not necessarily thinking, was this generated by ChatGPT, even though perhaps we should be thinking about that all the time, I was wondering if you had any idea of how to calculate how prevalent that jump might be between like the research and just the real world. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a super cool research idea. Yeah. You can go to io.sanford.edu and apply for a research assistant position. And <laughs> I mean, another research idea we had that I think we can probably no longer do because we came up with this before ChatGPT is like looking at the effect of, you know, what happens when you tell people about the capabilities of these models? How does that affect like general trust in the news and those kinds of things? But uh, we were just talking about how it'd be tricky to do now because, you know, so many more people are familiar with this um, 
but you know you could maybe do it in another country. Um, I think I might have just stolen our co-authors' our research idea, um, but yeah. Great. Oh, no, I don't. We got more. I think we've asked all the online questions, Ben. Unless you do, you have another one you want to read. Um, I guess I could ask more details because I'm very curious about the ways in which uh, platforms can detect um, AI-generated content, not through the content, but because of the behavioral oh, oh, wow. aspects. So would it be possible if you could tell us more about what are the key, like, top five indicators that uh, you have a bot or AI-generated content? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know because I don't work at the platforms, and for good reason, they are not gonna make that super public because, you know, if they say, this is what we're looking for, then, you know, bad actors are just gonna do something else. Um, like, probably, it's things like the one I just mentioned, you know, lots of accounts being created on the same day from the same device. Um, you know, maybe things about, um, like, IP addresses. Um, yeah, any other, what are some other, speculating uh, internal behavioral metrics you think platforms are using to detect this? Thing? So platforms have lots of interactivity data. So the vast majority of people use these platforms now on their mobile devices. And the, they have every touch, every scroll, every. And so something that a number of companies have moved towards is trying to build a model based upon how human it looks for their interaction on the phone itself. People have caught on to that. So if you look into spammers and such, they will have hundreds and hundreds of usually Android devices in which they plug into the accessibility layer and they try to do things like pretend to be. So I think what we'll, we'll end up doing is there will be more and more work at the operating system layer to provide, you know, what is the, if you sit here and type on a phone, I have two now, um, as you type, the accelerometer vibrates, right? Because to actually, if you're not simulating touches, the phone itself has to vibrate a little bit every time you touch it, right? Um, that's the kind of thing that actually gets a little more difficult to simulate. And so I think there will be a cat and mouse game, not on the content, but again, on the behavior, the behavioral aspects that demonstrate that somebody is alive. The other thing a number of people have moved towards, although it's mostly around child safety and such, but there has been a lot of discussion of requiring people when they create accounts to demonstrate human liveness. So even if you're not doing facial recognition of, I do facial recognition to see I'm Alex Damos, that you have a person who has to look into a video and say, you know, read, read a sentence, right? And then, do so in a way that's hard to fake and that that could reduce the amount of the ability for people to mass create accounts. Um, so I think a number of those things will be tried out, but again, it will be a back and forth with the, uh, the spammers. Okay, we have a bunch of great online questions. Um, you know, a, a question on the follow-up, have you evaluated open source models such as Llama uh, and compared effectively to GPT-3, considering because these you know, open source ones are easier to use, uh, this is research we're doing now. Uh, academic research takes a while. Uh, don't have to tell this crew this, but for the folks online, uh, it turns out it takes a while to do these kinds of surveys, to do the, the science, and then to submit them and get the r, &R but we are working on Llama, GPT-4, some other ones, um, and it will be interesting. So what, Shelby, how, how stable do you think the metrics will be across the different, like you feel pretty good about doing the same test over and over, or are we going to have to come up with new tests as we expand the panel of different output? I guess... You know, I think this will, you know, anyone who's played around with chat GPT will know that it's like very, its output is often like quite generic. Um, and so that kind of makes me think that it will do as good as GPT-3. I'm not like sure it's gonna do that much better. Um, I haven't yet played around with um, the others enough to know uh, whether they'll do that much Yeah, better. I mean, from my eyeball, Llama is as good as GPT-3 was, um, but we need to test that empirically for sure. Um, Beyond plagiarism checking tools, uh, is there a need to develop a tool able to detect AI-produced propaganda? Is it possible to do it? Um, how should a tool be developed? What does it look like? Yeah, so I think this goes back to something we were talking about, which is that at the moment, it's very difficult to do this, um, especially if a sophisticated actor is, um, is, you know, if like a unsophisticated actor, like a high school student is using this to plagiarize um, or is using this to write an essay, I think it's kind of easier to detect, but I think if sophisticated actors are doing this at the moment, there's no good way to detect this. Yeah. yeah. Um, generation is one thing. Uh, will supercharging the production side influence the whole disinfo ecosystem? I mean, it's a great question. I, I mean, I think it definitely changes the economics. And so a lot of different 
kinds of fraudulent behavior and disinformation scale that just wasn't, wasn't economical before will become. I think it also has a real democratizing effect that traditionally you only had like superpowers, Russia, China, the United States, able to build to put buildings together with hundreds of people who do propaganda. We have the, the Iran's in the Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has like di digital outlets that'll do this kind of stuff, but it's not the size of the big superpower. And I think now you'll be in a place where Mexico or UAE or these countries that um, have to buy their offensive cyber capability can now buy AI based propaganda capabilities that will be only 10% worse than what the US can do with, with hundreds or thousands of people. Was there, oh, question in the room? Thanks. Um, I think about the deceptiveness, deceptiveness of the actors themselves. And often when you look at the actors, they tend not to be very persuasive in terms of the personal characteristics they might have alongside propaganda around Russia or Ukraine or the US election. Um, I wonder just going forward, um, if you've thought about um, the AI generation of things outside the kind of political propaganda itself and the, the ability to... Yeah, maybe. I guess I think like the trend that I've that I think we've been seeing is, you know, instead of like if you create an account from scratch, even if you do a really good job with it and the profile photo has never appeared on the internet before, um, it's just like hard to grow an audience from closer. Okay. It's hard to grow an audience from scratch. Um, and so I think like what we've seen recently is hacking into existing popular accounts and then using that real organic audience to, to kind of push the content you want. So I think in my head, that's like more effective than somehow using AI to create a better AI generated photo for the profile photo or something. Well, like back that. to that point about specifically targeted, one of the other things you can do is you, if you have a, a certain billionaire with hundreds of millions of followers, if you can get propaganda that will, he will retweet or any, any influence will retweet. So using AI to generate stuff that's specifically targeted at one person is another way to get lift. Um, bunch of questions online. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them. I'm sorry, folks. Um, th there's one, I think, going to what I was saying about, you know, are you suggesting that propaganda might be most persuasive um, versus what is called a low information voter? That wasn't what I was trying to say, but do you want to answer that? Do, do, does this does this study answer that question at all? No, and I think, you know, I mean, the study is intentionally picking like covert propaganda that's probably false. But I think a lot of this stuff is not true or false, so it doesn't really matter if the uh, person reading it is educated or not. Um, you know, more to give like one example, um, we did an analysis into a network that Meta suspended a while ago on Facebook that originated in Iran and was targeting people in Afghanistan, and it was a pro-women's rights network because for whatever reason Iran wanted to like undermine the Taliban, so they were pushing out all this like the Taliban's bad for women narratives that I think like many people here would probably agree with. Um, so not only is it not falsifiable, it's probably content that like a lot of people would agree with. Um, and so I don't think that the persuasiveness of that content like varies based on whether it's an educated voter or not. Yeah, and what, what I was just saying is that it seems from the work we've done that topics for which people don't have preconceived notions, it's more effective, which is something that a lot of these actors know. Like the, the number one topic of, for all the discussion of Trump and Clinton in 2016, the number one topic of Russian disinformation actors for the last t five years is almost certainly Syria, um, right? Not not anything you know that people have really deep held beliefs about um you know, here's an interesting question not just students but why wouldn't local news networks cheat using ai writing articles about local issues is really fast and easy on chat gpt will journalists behave so it's almost a moral question one is it bad if journalists write stories that are factually accurate but they do so with ai what would you say to that I think if they disclose it, that's okay. I think it's kind of about disclosure. That's, I don't know, what's your thought? Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> I mean, it's, hey, like if, 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 I, if you write, if a journalist said, write a story with these 10 facts, it wrote the story for them and then they edited it and then the editor edits it. I mean, you, you know, you can't argue if, if it makes them better at their job and more efficient at their job, but it does also feel like setting the bar really low, right? 
So I give a talk at a high school recently, and one of the teachers there was telling me that he has an assignment for his like seniors where they they get a prompt, like a regular essay prompt, like you would for a class, and then they have to get ChatGPT to write the article, and then their job is to grade the article. Um, so I feel like that's kind of setting huh. young people up for a world where they're kind of interacting with these models. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, is there really no imaginable way to couple GPT internet search, maybe an ability to express a search goal as to a reference librarian in extracting search words. So I, I'm not saying that you can't use AI for search, large language models for search. I just think we're not there yet. Um, and from my perspective, what I would like to see, and I, I know there's some work in this, um, and OpenAI has done some of this, is that when these models say, here's a fact, that they reference where that comes from, right? And so I know there's a lot of work of, instead of just being a statistical cloud of, of statistical points, that you actually try to reference back to where did this come from, so you can make a judgment as to this sentence as a footnote, and I go to the footnote to see whether it's, it's reliable or not. And at the moment, what is the Bing search thing called that has ChatGPT at the moment? I'm forgetting the word for it. Oh, I forgot um, what their, yeah. their name. Anybody remember what they call it? Sydney. No, Sydney's the internal code name it, that people convinced it to tell. What's your name? My name's Sydney, but I'm not supposed to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are all sorts of issues with it at the moment, but um, I was playing around with it, and it won't uh, answer the question what happened during the Holocaust or what happened in the Rwandan genocide. So it will start to write the answer for you. Like you see it writing the answer in real time and then it will get to a word like massacre and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I actually can't answer this question for you and it like deletes everything it wrote. So I'm sure some of these issues will get sorted, but at the moment it's pretty janky. Yeah, I think what there is your scene is that Microsoft adds their own trust and safety layer on topics which they know are gonna be radioactive and they don't trust themselves yet. So they. They just put, so OpenAI is, is feeding into Microsoft on the API side, here's the content, and then at some point Microsoft's system sees, oh, you're talking about the Holocaust, <laughs> kill the whole thing because I don't want a story written about this. Cool, any other questions in the room before we wrap up? We'll just take one more. Hey, um, is it on? Yeah. Right, okay, so on the policy front, um, kind of previous efforts to combat disinformation started with the kind of hopeful like fact checking, creating these islands of trustworthiness kind of system, which has not been super effective. Um, but do you, because I agree with Alex that we're kind of facing now probably like an age of bullshit. And as kind of the internet or information domain in general turns more into kind of just a festering cesspool of scams and lies and bullshit, do you think maybe people would become more attractive to these kind of like fact check islands of trustworthiness, the New York Times and the stuff, as the normal internet become completely gross, or any thoughts? I don't know, I think it's an open question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, one can, I, the only hopeful thing here is that, you know, human society has survived these huge information upheavals although there's often horrible things that happen, right? Like hundreds of years of religious war from the printing press and fascism and, and you know, from radio and such. Um, and so will the, the AI bullshit, you know, will this, will it take a decade or for us to revert or will it take a hundred years for us to figure out? I mean, I, I could see a situation where I, I've seen this, you know, if you, if you have any parents of teenagers here, there's, there's a certain amount of like neo-Victorianism among kids these days that I think is partially a reaction to um, the, how difficult it is for them to live online in the social media era. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if these, these generations that come up behind us will go back to like being more careful about what they read and, and um, being like, if I, if I don't di get delivered on paper, I'm not gonna believe it, right? Like, I mean, it is possible that we'll have that reaction, but I don't think it's going to be necessarily of our generation or our parents. Um, and there is actually some good evidence that a lot of these issues get better as you get folks who are younger and who've had to grow up with it, but it might take a while, unfortunately. Okay, great. Um, so our, our next seminar uh, next week will actually be some more different. It'll be in the basement of McClatchy. Um, uh, and so directions will be sent out, uh, but uh, please join us in a week and let's uh, thank Shelby for her talk today. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you.